I think we've ever had because we're fully booked up to 500 people so have booked in today so um, very exciting to be with you and also very exciting to be with you talking about the great outdoors and this is a partnership event between St Helens Arts in Libraries Network and Libraries Connected um, so delighted to have Owen Hutchings here and James Valentine Burrows from St Helens Arts in Libraries Network and Clancy Mason from Arts Council England as well. So the webinar is going to start today with a speaker who I'll introduce in a moment, but it's also an informal session where we hope you'll ask lots of questions. So you need to find the chat function if you haven't already, it looks like lots of you have, but um, do find the chat function, put any questions in there because as, as Owen says, we'll be crowdsourced, there'll be crowdsourced problem solving going on during the day. So if you've got questions, pop them in the chat, but also, and if you can put those with a queue, but if you've got answers or solutions to any questions, if you can put those in the chat as well, just preface those by an A, um, that's going to be really helpful because we want this to be a really active and engaged session where we, we do lots of kind of solving each other's problems. Just a little housekeeping before we start. We are recording today's session. So if you prefer not to be filmed, you can switch off your camera. But if you could also keep yourself on mute during the presentations just to improve the sound for everyone, that would be really, really brilliant. Um, the webinar couldn't have been actually more timely today um, because as you know restrictions are easing one more well what we did ease one more step yesterday. Um, and so we're now in this situation where we have the rule of six or two households gathering together inside. So you can have a group of up to six from any, any number of households and children of all ages counting to that number of six or a group from any size from up to two households meeting together inside. Um, it, it gets a bit complicated with early years events if there's singing or shoutings involved where the, ad, the adults or the people with the under five should only be um, six people at any one time but outside you can have 30 people so the, uh, an outdoor limit of 30 people um, is really exciting for us at the moment and hopefully restrictions will ease again uh, in June so we're really excited to be thinking to, to the summer now what's going to be happening with libraries in the summer and what kind of events we'll be able to run creatively during the summer hopefully inside but also very much outside um, and how to manage those outdoor events I know that's been something that people have been asking really all year and thinking about how they're going to manage those outdoor events safely. So I'm absolutely delighted today to be handing over to Alan Lane of Slunglow, um, the award-winning theatre company. Alan is the artistic director, um, awarded a BEM for services to the community in December, it, it services to the community in Leeds during COVID back in December. Um, and from reading about what, what Alan's been doing, it, very very much deserved um, but he I know I've heard Alan speak before he's a really really exciting speaker doing amazing things in Leeds so I'm just really excited and really grateful that Alan was able to join us today to talk about outdoor events so over to you Alan. Thank you so much thank you so much for having me um, I'm really expect, uh, expect, excited to speak to you all it is a preposterously large number of librarians, which is is very exciting. Um, I'm gonna. Um, I've got 15 minutes, so um, I know that uh, the focus of today is to look at sort of practical solutions um, in our in our shared upcoming challenge of how the people come to events and do we feel really comfortable and be safe. But I'm I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about who we are because um, one of the things I kind of want to make clear is that how we have done this is because of who we are. Um, whereas uh, how how you do this will be because of who you are. So hopefully uh, that will make sense by the time I've finished in about 12 minutes. So we're a theatre company that specialises in making large out, uh, outdoor scale, large scale outdoor shows in city centres. So um, obviously that hasn't happened for the last couple of years. But one of the things we do is we run the oldest working men's club in Britain called the Holbeck, which is based in South Leeds. And um, from there we run uh, adult cultural educations, everything from bread baking to Irish dancing from Indian dancing to uh, blacksmithing or fire eating we did one time that was very popular uh, and, and this is our base and we run it as a theatre upstairs there's a 250 seater cabaret space and a performance space outside now as well everything we do here is pay what you decide and this is an act of charity it's an act of politics so you pay for the event whatever it is after the event and you decide how much you're going to pay and that's important to us but it's important within the context of 
um, our conversations here because we operate beyond the market. We are funded by the Arts Council. We're an MPO. We get £185,000 a year, uh, which in Holbeck is a, a princely sum, is a massive amount of money. And we use that money to operate beyond the market. Our income reports on our shows don't really exist. We don't plan to make income. We do get income and we spend it on other things. But that was really central to how we behaved in the last 18 months. And um, that might be something that we want to talk about later on. Uh, what's causing us to put these events on uh, has a big impact on how those events happen. So COVID hit and we shut the bar early because an old working men's club is basically uh, made up of people who COVID love to eat. So we shut before any of them got sick. Um, and then uh, we wrote a letter to our um, 200 nearest neighbours saying, hello, we get that you're scared, you're locked up. This is right in the beginning of the first lockdown. We're here, we're young enough to not be too scared. We're old enough to know a few things. We've got some money and we've got a van. Give us a shout if you need anything. And people got in touch to say, uh, walk my dog, pick up my prescriptions. Can you help me with a bit of food? All of that good stuff our neighbours were asking. And that really felt like mutual aid. And then the um, council got in touch today. We've heard what you've done for your 200 neighbours. Super cool. That's lovely. Could you do that for the whole ward? And we have a rule here that we say yes to everything because it's the only way to get into trouble. And we said, yeah, of course, absolutely. And what that meant was seven and a half thousand households, people who have a problem, ran the Leeds City Council coronavirus help helpline and they asked for help. And then basically that information was sent to us and it was our job to do that. So we did everything from, we uh, walked people's dogs, we changed their bedding, we took their bins out, we spayed someone's cat, which is, you know, not as a theatre company necessarily something. I want to make clear that we took it to a vet. We wouldn't, yeah, yeah, you understand. But mostly what happened was people started to say, I need food. So we live in an area which has a very high uh, population of unemployed, a very high proportion of people on zero hour contracts and people in the service industry. So this was a really bad time in the lockdown to be here. So mostly people just asked for food. And so we really quickly decided that what we needed to be was a food bank. You can see it behind me, it um, is still going. Um, and we really quickly decided that we wanted to be a food bank that didn't necessarily, and I promise all of this is important to how we put on shows, but we didn't want to be someone who, a food bank that decided who could or couldn't have food. Um, if you asked for food, it wasn't your job to demonstrate your pain to me. I'm a theatre director. I'm not qualified. It's strange for me to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to work and I'm going to decide who's lying and who's not. So we just said, if you ask for food, we give it to you. Now, obviously, in a city like Leeds, that is really quite, um, quite an undertaking. And so we very quickly went from doing 30 or 40 deliveries a week to doing 350 deliveries a week. And last week we did 450. So boxes of food behind me, that's what we delivered. That was the context for us stopping being a theatre because the COVID re restrictions came in. Uh, but it was also the beginning to us putting on events. And, it, and uh, yeah, I've done it as quickly as I can. It's important that you just understand that context because it, it, it explains some of our decisions moving forward. One of the things we did in the middle of the summer was uh, Mecca, the bingo hall, got in touch saying, we've got loads of food. Do you want it? And I was like, what sort of food? If you've never been to a bingo hall, it is the food of gods. It is something fatty with chips. And they said, we've got 60 portions of this. And we were like, well, yeah, OK. So we got we contacted 60, um, the parents of 60 children. I said, we can deliver hot food to you every lunchtime. Do you want it? And these kids were well, obviously like, if you've, if you've never known real popularity, walk down a street holding sausage and chips eight times and hand it to a family of eight. And you are truly a god amongst men. So we did that for a bit. And it was great because it was hot food. It wasn't very good for them, but, you know, life's short. Uh, and that was fantastic. And one of the things we started to notice was that these kids were in a period, in a, in a, this is last summer, in a state of emotional decline. It was clear the pressures were bearing. There wasn't much to do. There was no organised. There was none of the structure that was keeping them out of bad choices the parents are incredibly small houses in Holbeck with lots of children sometimes and that, that was a real pressure and things were getting worse kids were no longer excited about the food sometimes they'd be throwing things through and, and the parents were getting more stressed oh, like something needs to happen and we did loads of stuff before we put on an event we did loads of stuff we did an art gallery we made this book which I can tell you about later because you're librarians and we did loads of other stuff but it got to the point where none of it we were like yeah great that's what are we going to do now and we were like we're theatre makers what we're going to do is we're going to put on a show and we looked at the regulations and we were like, cool, well, this, is, this feels okay. We're going to invite 30 kids. We're going to put on a show. We're going to give them a story. We're going to give them something to look forward to because that's what we're for in this moment. We've been a food bank. We're doing all these other things. Now, if I can just show you these pictures now, can I, I think I can do this. I love that no one can share a screen on Zoom without um, narrating it. Um, cool. So you should be able to see there um, 
a picture of um, uh, some blue tents and uh, you, you're all getting that. You'll wave at me if you're not. And so we decided that we would, we would uh, thank you, we would we'd do this. So we, one of the things in, in previous times is we, we use headphones uh, to do a, um, to do our theatre. You wear headphones, the actors wear radio mics, and it means the distance between the performers and the, and the audience can be really very large. And in our, in our other shows, they're a few hundred metres. But in this, we thought, well, we could make it five or six metres. We'll put the actors, see at the top of the screen there, on a lorry, and then all the children will, will go in tents so that they're all facing the same way. So if someone sneezes, then it will just hit the back of the tent and it will be okay. And so this was our first, we, we did um, uh, 16 shows last year and each show had a different front of house uh, thing. Um, and this was our first reiteration. This is our first iteration of it to, to, look, at, to, to look at how we do this. How we do this. Uh, uh, somebody got their mic on because I'm getting myself back. Uh, can I do anything? Yes, I can. Great. And so, uh, so the audience sat in uh, tents, they wore headphones and they faced one way. And we hired so many people. There were 30 children at this thing. And I think I hired 10 people to look after me. It was absolutely ludicrous. None of, uh, this is definitely not me saying you should do it this way. I'm just telling you what we did. Um, and so every uh, group of audience was met by a different member of the uh, front of house. It was a really good time to be hiring actors because there wasn't any acting work and they were really happy to be ushers. And we led them in and do all that stuff. And then, so this is how they saw the show. Um, and as a practical solution, it was bomb-proof. Like it was really, we were like, this is so safe. Like there are pens and ropes and tents and microphones. This is like NASA. There was one small kerfuffle with this, which is we were absolutely certain that this was legit. We were like, yes, we told the police, we told the HSC, we told the council. And the morning of the show, the culture secretary stood up and said, in two weeks time, I expect there to be allowed to be outdoor public performances. And I was like, oh, sugar. Because if you're expecting something to happen in two weeks' time, it very much gives the inclination that it might should not be happening today. And at the point he made that announcement, we were two hours out, and we made the choice. Um, we talk a lot about here about taking risks and being really clear about why we do things. And it was clear to us in that moment that there was a moral imperative for those children to have something to look forward to. And we decided to persevere with our course of action, despite the culture secretary uh, saying otherwise. It turned out, actually, that all the people who you would expect to be furious if um, you do that were very cool and we're like yeah got it seen it seen your risk assessments we can't give you permission because you're obviously clearly a lunatic but we're not going to arrest you this is very clear the things that and this is this is important uh, when we do events the people who were very angry were other people who uh, had might want to put on theatre and decided they didn't want to and actually that's something that we've got to start talking about now as we open up is that actually the other people around theatres in the city were like if he gets this wrong and it all goes wrong, this is going to be a kind of reputational damage on all of us, um, which is both correct and also um, that's the best argument I've ever heard for standing still and doing nothing for the rest of your life. But there we are. So this was our first go at the show and, and it was a couple of um, weeks earlier than it should have been, but everything after that was, was fine and the kids had the most amazing time. The extraordinary thing about this uh, is that the kids who came to this wouldn't have come to anything else, really. They were very unusual children. We were delivering them hot food. We had a, we had a unique relationship with them. And they came to this. They came to every single thing we did for the rest of the year. The kids who came to see this sat in the gutter. I don't have the photo here. And watched the dress rehearsal of Opera North show. Kids who would never, if I said to them, do you want to come see an opera? They were like, no. But they're really happy sitting in this car park watching theatre now. And I don't think that's because that show was amazing. And I don't think it's because we we're amazing. I think it's because there was literally a world of nothing. Uh, sorry, uh, there was literally a world of nothing else going on. And that was, uh, that meant that we were the only thing they were getting. And that was really important. Um, so, um, sorry, there's somebody attacking me from behind. This is exciting. We're going to keep going. So then uh, that became uh, the first of 16 shows. And the next one we did was uh, a bonfire um, in, uh, in our front, in our car park. If you can see there, you can see the bus to the left and the building in front of us uh, and the bonfire. And again, this was trying to find ways in which people could be safe. Um, but still be exciting because the problem with this one is it was safe but it wasn't massively exciting once you got over the thrill of doing it you were like well this is not necessarily the best way of um uh of putting on theater the tents were quite cumbersome the views were quite bad so we knew that we had to keep developing new ways so this was we would do it in uh uh the night time and there was a fire and it kind of quite i felt quite thrilling um and people were really very far apart from each other and really, really cold, but nonetheless, uh, really quite excited. Um, 
The next one was our, uh, not the next one, but the, the one I want to talk about next is uh, we started to build infrastructure. So with this one is it was quite exciting, but we literally did just build a fire in the middle of the park uh, um, and set fire to stuff. And that, that, was, a, that was a kind of raw thrill. Uh, but the problem with that was if you keep doing that, it just looks like you don't really care about anything. Um, and then so we decided to start building um, uh, infrastructure. So um, here we have a stage. I and mean, then when you can see that, that's me in a tuxedo. Um, that's the only way that I would normally dress, but I know that librarians like uh, more casual attire. Uh, uh, and there was a double stage. So we were able to get much more many people in here because there was always something to look at. And again, the headphones really helped us out here. If we had to throw our, our voice, um, this would be um, really difficult. Um, so we turned this um, outdoor space into uh, a kind of permanent auditorium for the whole year. These fences are really ugly, but they were kind of central to our ability to control people. Every, every single, and there's one last, every kind of um, version of an audience management system that we had relied on, on two things. Being able to demark between people who are not in the audience and people who are in the audience. Because the minute you start doing anything at the minute, boom, people just come out of nowhere and go, what's this, what's this? And you're like, no, I planned this event for 50 people. You're gonna ruin everything. That was really important. And, and, um, and, and the second thing is people. This is why I started with, we're beyond the market. The amount of front of house staff we have for this is huge. Now for us, because of how we operate and how we're funded, that's great because we were able to, uh, we were able to hire all the people who had lost work other ways. This became part of our ability to support our community of artists because they could come and be, but it meant that at any given point, there was 10 to one, five to one, sometimes even four to one of staff. So if you're like, oh, hang on a minute, how are we gonna clean all those hands? Not a problem. We've got 20 people and we've got 20 bottles. So nothing I say here and nothing that I will talk about with you is, is a way of making profitable theater, which is, is why I draw the distinction between what we're doing in the tents and what the other people in the city were worried about. We're not trying to make profit. We don't need to, the Arts Council give us money to do stuff. And, they, and we, we would expect to do it even if we can't make any money. Every single one of these shows was free. We even got rid of the pay what you decide so that we couldn't be accused of trying to find ways of getting money. That's not a statement on your business model. It's just ours. We were like, well, we actually don't need the money. And if we save this, it's one less way we can be criticized. And one less thing for people to worry about because obviously handling money is a whole other thing. And then the final, so just so that it's not because those were dark pictures, it, it sometimes was as simple as getting a really good product that understood the context of how they were performing. So this is a great theatre company. If you've not come across them, they're called Last Theatre. They're brilliant. They do a really fun version of The Lion Inside. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's big. So they build this big thing. So it means that it was just as simple as going, oh, I'll just put some chairs out. How many families have we got? Oh, we'll just do, we'll just do that. Um, uh, can I see? Can't stop sharing without narrating it either. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm back. Um, brilliant. So yeah, I'm just coming up on time. So the things that I would, uh, uh, I would, I would, um, I would draw your attention to are those things about complete control of the space. Those white fences, everybody hates those white fences, but they were cheap and they were solid. And they, and it was really clear that if you're standing over there, you're not part of our, of our control. And that was really important. We'd never done that before. We'd never felt the need to do that before, but we really had to here. The second was that number of, of, of people that if those opportunities and, and now we're coming out of this and CRF money is, is gone and all those other considerations, now our volunteers from the food bank really want to get involved in the show. So our, our front of house staff might now become volunteers, whereas in the way we were using them to prop up the kind of um, artistic community of leads in some, some fees. So there are different ways of doing it, but having a really high person to audience chills everyone out because everyone goes, hang on, because what they really care about is they want to have a good time, but they want to make sure you're going to look after them. And one of the ways you demonstrate you can look after them is look at this team that's going to look after you. Every corner is manned or a person, sorry, and staff. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and that's really important. And then the third, which is our little cheat, and I can just quickly see that there's some some uh, questions here about the headphones, is, is that little bit of technology. They're not expensive. You can borrow ours for free, but they're not expensive. Um, but they just allowed us to be able to raise our voices in a way that wasn't shouting. And it made the difference. 16 shows last year, every single one was rammed full. And, and more importantly, and this is where I began with, every single one was bringing sucker to someone. 
we've made theatre before that's been on the telly, that's made a lot of money, that's got marks out of five that are good in the newspapers and all that nonsense. It was the first time ever when the things we were doing, these are tiny shows for us, they were not impressive shows, but they were genuinely bringing comfort to people. They were giving people what they wanted, which is stories. And I totally know I do not need to convince this audience of the power of stories, but we, it was a revelation to us that we were there going, oh my goodness, we have never been so vital to our audience. And that was worth all the cost and all the effort. And that's my 15 minutes, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I don't really, I have the unenviable task of, task of saying a few words um, after you now, and I, I, I should not have put myself in that position because your passion and enthusiasm for what you do shone through, and I'm just going to sound really boring now. So um, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, for, for those people that haven't had the unlucky misfortune to meet me before, my name is Owen Hutchings and I'm the Senior Arts and Libraries Officer for St Helens Borough Council. On behalf of everyone in the team at St Helens Borough Council and St Helens Borough Council's Library Service, I'd like to extend a, a warm welcome to you all. Um, we've, with the help of um, funding from Arts Council, we've been delivering arts in libraries activities um, for the best part of a decade now and we became one of the, only one of the six um, library authorities across the country to join ACES national portfolio of organizations in 2018 and um, despite organizing hundreds of events in that time um, we have very little experience of running outdoor events ourselves so i'm just as curious about learning about outdoorsy things uh, we need to consider uh, as much as anyone else that, that's here today and um, before we move on to the q a session section of today's session which is the bit that i'm sort of tasked with facilitating um, we've got a few plants in the audience who we'd who we've managed to who have managed outdoors events before in in libraries and, and other settings and i'd like to invite them to give us a few top tips for managing um outdoors events so the first person who is up is uh, melissa matthews who's the creative programs manager for suffolk libraries who's going to share her top nugget of wisdom for us melissa are you out there I'm out here. I'm here. I've got my. I'm, I'm poised. I've got my thirty seconds. I wasn't ready to be first though, so I'm a bit, oh, bit, bit nervous. Someone's got to be Melissa. I'm sorry, um, you draw the short straw. What, what can you do? And um, so, in terms of my experience of managing outdoor events, so I my previous role was putting orchestras in car parks. So that was my. That's where my experience come, comes from. So my top tip is plan for your team's comfort because. Traditionally, when you're doing outdoor events, you don't have a very a nice little kitchenette sort of sitting there. And actually, bottles of water, bringing us of a flask of um, hot water so you can make tea and things like that is the difference between being absolutely flat on your face at the end of the day and just feeling a little bit human. And also just things like planning it, planning in comfort breaks, planning time for you to kind of decompress because normally setup takes a really long time take down takes a really long time so just planning in that time just to kind of just go okay we're going to look after our team and we're going to just make sure that we're all properly hydrated i think i've run over my 30 seconds but that's my top tip Be looking, comfortable. looking looking after your team's really uh, obviously really important isn't it and we all know that librarians need tea and and biscuiting constantly so that's that's a really good top tip <laughs> so uh, the next person i am going to go to is um is um liz gardner who is um, Stock Services and Activities Officer for Staffordshire Libraries. Liz, I know that you're there because I saw you before. Liz, top tip. You were around earlier. She got, she gone shy. No, okay. It's all right, Liz, it's all right. she's there. I think she just needs to unmute, that's all. She's... That's all right. Hello, sorry. Hello, Liz. Um, yeah, so uh, top tip. From me, um, basically, I've done lots of outdoor events with libraries over the years, but this year obviously has been really challenging. Um, top tip from me is work with partners wherever possible, because two heads are better than one, or possibly multiple heads are better than one. And um, in terms of looking at managing your space and what you're delivering and having a positive experience for both your audience and your staff or your volunteers, it's really important that you get as many heads on it as possible. And I think that was really clear from from the thing that Alan was saying, actually, wasn't it? That that actually most of us probably have got a lot, haven't got a lot of experience of necessarily doing events outside. But there are organisations such as Slonglo and different organisations in across the country that will be very much um, set up for that ethos. So I think even if you're not necessarily going to be 
working in partnership to manage the event just reaching out to some of those people to ask some of those those questions that you might have is 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 a, a bit of a no-brainer really isn't it because there's so much expertise or speak to your relationship manager from the arts council who will know people that might they might be able to put you in touch with so that's a really great tip liz thank you very much and then the last person um i uh, hopefully she is around is ellen bianchi who is director for hull's big malarkey festival ellen are you on the call I'm just making those noises to kind of make up time, but I can't see Ellen. So um, uh, let's go to, um, there's a couple of questions in the chat um, that, that you will be able to answer, I think, Alan. Um, and one was just about, uh, well, well I'll, ask, I'll ask Zara to ask it really. Zara Kimmins asked a question about cl the cleaning of um, tents. Uh, Zara, do you want to ask that? Are you happy to come on the screen? Yeah, it's okay. So that's my daughter, but I don't know how to change the name. Apologies. Um, oh. It's Carolyn. And <laughs> she must have changed it somewhere. Sorry. Um, it, could, it could be worse. It, it could be something really unprofessional, couldn't it? And, and that would be really embarrassing. No, Zara's <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it's fine. It, it was just that, did you have to clean the tents afterwards? And if so, how did you clean them? Did you just wipe them down or was there? Because obviously I know tent materials mm. are different. So the uh, so the um, advice at the time, and I think it still is, that basically anything outdoors uh, like that for 24 hours is no longer contagious. So because we're only doing one show a day, we just left them outdoors. Um, but uh, we just have an awful, we have an unbelievable stock of anti back wipes, um, and pretty much decent industrial anti back wipes will clean anything. People are asking the same questions about the headphones. You have to do that in non-COVID times because they go on people's ears and people's ears are horrible. So you, if you use headphones, you spend quite a lot of your life cleaning. But a, a, a really good, decent industrial box of um, anti-back wipes and some gloves and you can get almost anything clean. And that's pretty much what we did. That, at the time, that's what um, public health was saying. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Oh, and just one more question about the yes, web. I, yes, I saw that you posted oh, that as well. And, and, and thank you very much for being my plant to put that in the chat. Um, <laughs> Uh, what Alan and I know that Alan's got a lot of opinions on this, so I'm going to I'm going to come to him. Um, what do we do in the event of um, bad weather, Alan? What's your opinions on such matters? I, I, I if, if if it's not lightning, you keep going. Uh, if you're if you're an outdoor theatre company in the north of England and you stop every time it rains, you do will not have a reputation for very long. So. Um, you keep going. I think uh, the I think it was Melissa was talking about um, team care. Like, spend some money on some really good waterproofs because they will they will return uh, many fold. People aren't stupid, especially their families. I don't know a parent that sets off with their kids into a rainstorm without getting them dressed properly because you only ever make that mistake once. So you can rely on your audience. The audience that turn up are going to be hardy. So you might have a smaller audience, but I've never done a show in the rain when they haven't felt like heroes and they haven't enjoyed it. Um, uh, there's some safety stuff, so you, like your your technicians need to be across all the all the power stuff. That's obvious. You can't go and start dancing in the rain. But it also rains a lot less in the north of England than people think it does. If you're if you're a, if you're if you're in an office, you look out your window and it, it's been raining uh, an hour ago. You're like, oh, it's raining. It's not raining. If you're outside, you're like, it stopped raining. You're cheering. So you've just got to lower your bar <laughs> to the point where if it's not actually raining down the back of your cagoule, you're happy. It is um, a lot less. Uh, it is a lot less arduous than people think. We've spent the last ten years standing outside in Hull and Liverpool and Manchester, and you get wet a lot less than you think you do. Um, and never cancel the show. Yes, Gemma, there was a night of blood and chocolate. She's just saying where it came in horizontal, but it felt like an um, action movie. Um, so, yeah, it, anyone who turns up in the rain to watch an event is a hero. And I think the least we can do is honour that heroism with um, some gumption. I think. And, and I think that the thing about it is, is that after a year of not being able to go out to activities people are desperate to go out to that to those activities so yeah. if you were to to get the kids ready and chuck all the clothes on and then you get an email from from someone saying we've we've pulled it without really 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 good reason you're, you're more likely to be open to criticism than than if you were to, to carry on 
with the with um yeah. with United. I mean, obviously, if you have got wind and lightning and and, and really bad circumstances, yeah. you kind of have to 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 just get through that, I suppose, don't you? And the other thing, just to say, because I know there's loads of questions, but none of us are doing Glastonbury. Most of the time you have to cancel wet weather because your toilets are away on a river. We're just talking about 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 people being in a park doing something or sitting in a car park. And you, you don't have the same infrastructure issues that, that you might. If you're running, if I'm running a Mela or a Gala or something, I'm going to start worrying about flooding, but not if I'm telling a story for an hour. Um, Craig Lucas wanted to ask a question about photography a photography club and a photo walk did you want to ask your thoughts craig hi yeah yeah hello <laughs> um yeah so um yeah i run a photography club in the in the library and uh, we have a canal outside and it's very picturesque and i just thought um at the moment we can't have meetings in the library because limits on numbers and stuff um so i thought it'd be a great idea we could meet outside Go for a walk, take some photos, have a bit of instruction. I was just wondering, like, is that okay? Is there self health and safety issues? Do I need to do risk assessments or that sort of thing? Um, I I can come in with a little bit of an answer to that because, funnily enough, last Friday we did a photo walk from um from St Helens Library, um, and we have a canal in St Helens, and we walked, right. walked along alongside um the, the canal for that particular event. And obviously we, we did a risk assessment for it, but but the, the people that I would encourage you to speak to in the first instance is people from your sports team or your sports development team, because we we have sports development officers who run um, walks and will have walk instructors that have those sorts of skills around at risk assessing a walk. Um, you know the, the 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 questionnaires that you need to give out beforehand. So it, it, it's I think. The answer to that would probably be yes, go ahead and do it, but just think about those things that you need to do. But speak to your, speak to your sports development team because they will have advice about that and are probably desperate to partner with people at, yeah. at the minute. And even if they don't have um, they don't have any sports instructors per se, they will at least have risk assessments to help you think about those things that you you need to to do. And um, so that would be my top tip about that, but there might be other people that have um, questions as well. Okay. That answers uh, as well. Thanks a million. And, if, and come back to me if if, um, um, if you don't get anywhere with them, come back to me and ask if I can find our risk assessment that we did for the, the canal walk in St. Helens. But it was exact, very similar to what you were saying. And it, 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 it was about a walk. It was about meeting at the new library and about people going and having an opportunity to, um, to, to, uh, to, to, to bring together a few different services, library, arts, and sports. And I know Mandy, Mandy, are you around? Because you were on that walk. Do you want to talk about how it went? Uh, Mandy Brown? Sorry to put you under the spotlight, Mandy, but are you Thanks there? Thanks for this, Owen. Yes, I'm here. You're welcome. No problem. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I attended the walk on Friday. Um, it was such a lovely, um, a lovely hour and a half of our time. We had a mixed group of uh, ages and uh, Gemma from the sports development led the walks. She made sure that, as Owen has said, all the risk assessments were covered and that any medical concerns were highlighted um, so that, you know, they could be picked up throughout the walk if need be. We just strolled, took our time and the group naturally stopped at certain points where they could see that it was a lovely place to take a photograph and then we encouraged the group to then share those photographs through our library social media as well um, and it, it really was a, a lovely well-being experience that's how I would describe it so I encourage anyone to do the same yeah excellent thanks Thank Mandy sorry go on so I was just saying Did someone else? go on sorry Craig. Yeah, excellent so I'll mute and get out of the way um, uh, uh, I'm just trying to look through. I'm trying to manage too many things at once. So I'm just trying to find another. Oh, toilets. Jessica, a question about toilets. Do you want to ask that? Mm. You don't have to. I could just ask it for you if you prefer not to say anything. Hello. No, sorry, I was just trying to unmute there. Yeah, do you have to provide toilets um, or do you just expect kind of participants to 
to go when they're at home and then at the end and just kind of keep the performance um, a certain time scale so you're not required to provide them or do we need to invest in portaloos? That's a really good question. I'm you, sure Alan will have something to... Do, do everything you can to avoid portaloos. They are, they are, I mean, you need them like we sometimes do conferences and festivals and you need them, but otherwise they are a royal pain in the bum and nobody likes them. So they all they do is complain about the board lose. Um, we definitely were aware that we didn't want um, intervals. So when you were saying about length of time, um, we used to run a venue that, that was a railway arch and we never had a show longer than 60 minutes because you would get hyperthermia at 70 minutes. So it's just so that, that is something to bear in mind. We're really lucky here because all of those shows were in the car park of a pub which we run so the toilets in the pub the pub wasn't open so none of those shows to be open the bar but we just created a, co a corridor through to the toilets and then there was just one member of staff who would clean the toilet after each use um we halfway through that run of shows we realized that that didn't need to be a member of staff there could just be a, a packet of wipes left at the door saying you know please please clean the toilets you know wipe the taps down and that afterwards and people started doing that so that so we kind of modified our uh, um, risk assessment as we went on because we we really needed the people out dealing with the um with the audience rather than cleaning the toilet every three minutes but yes uh, the first show we did that blue tent where we got into a bit of bother we told everyone we wouldn't open the building because at the time buildings couldn't be open and we just said to them please but we had asked all the people we'd asked were within walking distance of the venue. So we just said, the show's 45 minutes long, have a wee beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I think there was one uh, moment when a five-year-old boy stood up and had a wild wee, but that was my son. <laughs> and so really that was my fault. So yeah, so there's kind of, there's always, uh, again, if we were doing Glastonbury, you need toilets for 20,000 people and you need to be aware of X, Y, and Z. I, I, I've not seen any of the questions that uh, that's ever really something that we're thinking about. You're just thinking about the care of the people with the same um with the set we say here with the same creativity and inventive just that you're dealing with the with the actual content that's been the big shift and, and toilets is part of that right thank you I, did that answer your question jessica yeah it does yeah it's, it's and i think, to think I about think, isn't it it's yeah we're not doing um three hour long um shakespeare performances here are we we're not no, no one's planning to do that so and i think the thing is as well that if you're doing your event at the library space and your libraries are open for browsing and things anyway that they if, if you're not if you haven't got hundreds of people going through the space why not just direct them to those spaces yeah. if, if you need to but generally i would say try and encourage people to 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 think ahead yeah no that's great thank you um i was going to bring um just if there's a local supermarket, like w there's a local supermarket, just talk to the manager and say, look, I've got 20 people coming. Is there a chance I can use you? I've never known anyone say no to that. Um, so port portaloos are literally the worst solution to that problem. <laughs> Only go there if you really need to. It's just peeing in a plastic bucket. <laughs> really expensive plastic bucket. Anyway. Owen's gone and we're leaderless. Jessica, you were the last to speak. I think you're in charge now. Let me just let me just jump in while we've lost lost. Um... This is thrilling. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, this a bit. I, I was just going to ask Alice, Alice from Rural Touring to speak. Alice, do you want to jump in and say say what you were talking about in the chat? Oh, hi. Uh, this is completely unprepared. I wasn't expecting <laughs> to do this. <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Alice. Um, I work for Applause Rural Touring. Um, I may have spoken to a couple of you, actually, because um, we've been speaking to library services a little bit over the last couple of months, um, particularly in the southeast, which is where we operate, about trying to do some programming um, in, well, indoors or outdoors, but particularly this summer, thinking about um, utilising outdoor spaces in the library or in... Um, other spaces around your library, so whether there's some green spaces nearby. Um, so I've put my email address in the chat, but I'll just drop it in there again. But um, yeah, we're here um, to support you, to help you um, be able to uh, run these events. And if you're not based in the Southeast, then there are other rural touring organizations all across the country. Um, so it's worth trying to have a look and see who those people are for you. And um, yeah, we're here to help you be able to put on events. So do get in contact with us. 
Oh, thanks, Alice. Um, and, and just to say as well, we'll try and I, I just there's so much going on in the chat that we'll try and capture it all because then we can kind of sort it out and try and answer any questions that we haven't been able to answer during the course of this session. But there have been a couple of questions about numbers and Isabel Hunter from Libraries Connected, Isabel spends her life kind of trying to keep up with the latest guidance and, ch and changing the, the Libraries Connected guidance as, as things change. Isabel, would you like to unmute and just and just say what you were saying in the chat in response to some of the questions about numbers so not, numbers are, are complicated at the moment so um, i'm still talking to dcms so we can get clarity on on all of these things and hopefully hopefully we can publish the revised library service recovery toolkit well uh tomorrow or, or this week to make that clear so you can do larger events but what you'll need to do is consult the guidance for performing arts um which, which explains this in more detail so in all these cases, the key thing is to do a risk assessment um, of the, um, you know, and think about your space and your staffing. Um, and at the moment, it's still about making sure that social distancing can happen um, and that your audience um, isn't all seated together, that it could be a larger audience you'd seat in uh, groups of six or the two households or, or otherwise separate out. So I think one of Alan's slides of the show in the car park with little family clusters seated together. So larger outdoor events um, or indoor events are possible, but there will be natural limits on the capacity of your space. And ob um, so obviously outdoors is a bit more freedom. You don't have the problems about uh, ventilation um, and it's a bit safer. But yeah, it's, it's still based on the idea of social distancing and being able to manage people carefully within that space. So I hope that makes, makes a bit more sense. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks very much for that. And we'll just, and just say keep an eye on the, the Libraries Connected guidance as we as we update it um, over, the, over the coming days. Um, we've got a question about, uh, we've got quite a few, so many questions, but a question about catering and refreshment. So, Alan, can you tell us if you are catering for, for any events at the moment? Um, yeah, we do, because uh, we're also a pub uh, from, well, from yesterday, but we open tomorrow we do table service so we just move the table service outside um and then i think in five weeks we move our first um show inside uh so it will be a reduced we got 280 capacity upstairs so we'll go to about 100 and do that as um I think isabel was saying in groups of six and all that good stuff um table service for everything uh, which again is it sort of brings me back to you will need a lot of waiters <laughs> a lot of waiters um but that, that's okay that's what's needed to make everybody um feel safe so yes we do and then the family shows that i showed you pictures of what because we were also food bank we were getting loads of we would just go around and give everyone a bottle of juice and a bottle of chocolate or whatever it was we but again that taking money for it it was the most complicated part so we just decided not to i get that that's a really privileged position to be in but that, that was the position we're mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and a couple of a couple of questions that Alan could answer, but other people as well, if they can just unmute yourself and jump in. But it, it's a question about stray children, <laughs> very young children wandering away from families, um, and and just just kind of keeping people in in family groups. And so, anybody anyone sort of tips about managing that? I can shout up on that one. It's Liz, Liz Gardner. Yes, thanks, Liz. Does that help? Um, what we do, what we do with outdoor events, um, we make little nests for people to stay in. So they could be just like a, a sectioned off space or like a chalk line, or you know, if we're doing sort of a wildlife themed event, then we kind of make it look like they, they we get them to help build like a little nest in the space, and then we tend to find that younger children will feel invested in that space. So they'll mm -hmm. kind of, if they kind of help to create the space themselves, they'll tend not to wander. Yeah. The other thing as well is to provide a really simple activity for people to do while they're sitting or waiting. You know, if the show's about to start and they're not started or if the kid might get a bit bored, have something available. And what we did as well is to always say to, to families, you know, if you think, you know, there might be a little bit of waiting, there might be moments when things aren't happening and, and if your children are going to get bored, make sure they bring something with them, like a toy or something that they're happy to, to sit and play with, just to give them a bit of a focus. So I think it's how you kind of manage the expectation of the event and, you know, that kind of put pointers in for people to, to kind of work around any possible issues, really. 
And I suppose right. that, that all comes into your um, communications that go out to people, isn't it, beforehand, whether you're booking via Eventbrite or any other systems that you might have. It's about letting people know what those expectations are on them, I suppose, as a parent or, or, or if it's not for children, if it's an event for adults, that, that you, you're asking them not to, you know, to, to keep an element of control. And we know that that's not always possible, but just um, given the expectations and the communications ahead of an event, just to let people know, what you're going to be asking of them, I guess. Shirley Everall from Hertfordshire. Shirley, you, you were talking. Do you want to unmute and say what you did, Shirley? Yeah, hello. Um, what we did in Hertfordshire is we were working with a local storyteller and we asked people to bring a picnic blanket and the families had to stay on their picnic blanket while the storyteller was performing it worked really well um people bought cushions and things and we did do one in the pouring rain with the parents trying to hang on to the children because you certainly could sit, sit on the floor but it, it went really well and everybody was just so grateful that you thought okay it's worth standing here looking like a drowned rat <laughs> i can cope with it um yeah so we've done about five of those with this same storyteller but we just sort out two meters apart for each person to sit and then they put their blanket down and that's their area for the um for the event brilliant thanks shirley um ali clark has a brilliant question about um mobile libraries and ali do you want to ask that hi there um hi, yeah, i just wanted to um ask about um if anybody's used their mobile libraries in Cambridgeshire, we've got some new mobile libraries which have awnings that come out. We've got toilets on there. We've got a good source of limited electricity. Not if you want a massive big PA system, but for lighting and LED lighting and stuff. I just want to know if anybody else has used their mobile libraries. We've done storytelling on our libraries in the past, and we're hoping to support our brilliant uh, the Library Presents team to do some events coming up in the next few months. I um, just want to know if anybody's got any top tips, handy hints. Uh, does anyone have any experience of using their mobile libraries in that uh, way? We're always open to being hired out as well, you know, for <laughs> travel costs. This isn't an opportunity to make some profit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if anybody has, they can get in touch with me uh, off, off the... Um, Question about distancing here from Kathy Harbord about distancing and is it still two meters between family groups? We're I still doing two I... meters between family groups. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, that's, sorry. Yeah, that's one of the details we've been confirming with um, GCMS and their COVID hub. So yeah, two meters social distancing. So is that indoors group. and outdoors, Isabel? Um, as far as I know, yeah. Like, so outdoors, you can have a group of, of uh, 30 together. Um, I'm just trying to go through the chat. Was there any... Oh, um, Clancy, you said that um, Francesca Goodhart had some good experience... Uh, good experience of running events outdoors. Francesca, did you want to say um, a little bit about uh, about that? Um, about your non-theatre experience, Clancy suggested uh, bringing you in. Oh, um, uh, so in, in COVID times, uh, so I've been, I don't work for a library, just had to out myself before anything else happens. Uh, I actually work for the museum service. I'm in the heritage learning team. Uh, uh, Lancashire County Council um, and uh, I've been running a, a, a youth engagement project with a group of young people who were supposed to be on a festival last year which was obviously cancelled and they're now planning uh, an outdoor event at one of our sites which is Helmshaw Textile Mill Museum uh, so we've been the reason I went on to this course actually was to try and help them out with a bit of um, everybody's experiences um, yeah, we're looking into all sorts of different ways around things. Uh, we've been doing a few little kind of 
uh, outdoor events, uh, sort of miniature ones, just to kind of try out what worked in a, an outdoor space and what we might need. And in terrible, interesting weather, not terrible weather, because it's your, it's Lancashire and it's, you know, it's still, it's always beautiful, whatever weather. Um, so we are looking at um, things like getting pop shields the microphones when they're doing a kind of uh, open mic scenario. Uh, we've looked at the headphones option for doing kind of silent disco type of scenario. We've got um, a company called Outdoors for All coming to do uh, talks uh, talks by the fire, which they've been running all the way through lockdown because it's a mental health and support group. So they've been able to carry on doing it. And that's, uh, again, we've sorted it out so that People kind of book a time slot, they come in, they grab a piece of cardboard and they sit down on their log by the fire and they can chat and they can talk to the people, facilitators there. Um, they're all risk assessed up to the eyeballs. Uh, and then when they're done, they can get up and they put their piece of cardboard on the fire. So it's no cleaning that's required. Um, and we're getting in, um, using our outdoor team and another organization to do a, uh, an outdoor kind of walking and activity trail with little performances en route. Um, and potentially looking at seeing if we can do some outdoor activities like archery and stuff, just checking all the clean down arrangements. So we haven't done the big event yet. It's it's on the way. It's like walking through treacle at the moment because it's uh, meant to be youth led. So trying to get it all done on Zoom is, is a bit of a nightmare. We're getting there by increments. <coughs> so yeah, any additional ideas and experiences people have had with that would be uh, much appreciated. And anyone who'd like to get involved, Give me a shout. Um, that's great. Thank you very much, Francesca. I'm going to bring um, Clancy in from um, Arts Council England because she's just um, posed a, a good question in our WhatsApp group that we've got. So I'm going to bring Clancy in to ask this. Um, so yeah, I know everybody's sort of taking, you know, some sort of relatively baby steps and testing ideas to, to get activities taking place outdoors. But I wondered if anyone's sort of planning a bit further ahead with, say, the Summer Reading Challenge or Literature Festivals or, you know, some things that look a little bit more like usual programming. Or does that feel a little bit too risky yet? You know, I'm just trying to get a bit of a, a sense of where people are at or, or, or what they might be planning. I, I don't know about yourself, Alan, if, have you got a sense about what you're looking at programming and, and any of the other libraries too? Yeah, we, we, um, we're we doing the whole Holbeck Gala, which is the, like a village fate, but in a Ken Loach movie, uh, which is thousands of people. Um, and that, that will operate as is, that's the first week of July. That they, um, we've put lots of things in. We're having to fence that off for the first time, which is a real problem. And we're also, I'm very glad, Clancy, that it looks like it's a stitch up, but it really isn't. This is a secret, so don't tell anyone, but we're doing the Creative Thinking uh, Conference for the Arts Council in the first week of September. Uh, we haven't announced it and we won't announce it until next week, but we never have enough people coming from libraries. Uh, and therefore, when I knew that there were going to be 335 of you all in the same place, I would urge you to uh, check out Sunglow Socials next week because the tickets always go really quickly. And that's a big meeting of 500 people in a field. And there's been a lot of conversations with with um, Arts Council, uh, the London office, just about is that safe? And, and again, kind of that ends up being a moral as well as a logistical que uh, question. And so it's, it's quite an interesting time to be organising events when actually the ethical issues are as big as the as the practical ones. So. Um, Great, thank you, Alan. Um, I'm 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 dead aware that there's loads of there's loads more questions in here, but we did say we would wrap up at two thirty, so I am I am going to um, wrap things up. I think quite there's been quite a few com um, comments in the chat about numbers. So what, what and, and thanks to Isabel for putting the the, the link in there about um, um, about what the guidance actually is and what we'll do. I'll, we'll, I'll send the link for that out to everybody after this email when I send after this meeting when I send the evaluation out as well. And also, I noticed a question um, about um, whether we, whether people had started reading rhyme times back up. And in St Helens, we have started reading rhyme times back up um, indoors. So if you wanted any advice about that, I can't see the, the person who posted that now. But if you email me, I'll put you in touch with the people who who are in St Helens that are running um, Read and Rhyme Times again. So um, thanks very much. I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer absolutely everything, but it's been, it's, um, it's been so good that you, that everybody that's, that's here has, um, uh, has in, in engaged with us and um, has asked questions. And if there's anything 
specific that you want to ask, feel everybody's got my email address now because um, I know that I emailed everybody. Around. Email me that question and I will um, send it around to, 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 to anyone else that's one part of the um, part of the group that's been here today and, and we'll try and answer that for you um, outside of this if we if we if we can. Um, so without uh, the, the only thing that's left for me to do really is to thank um, Libraries Connected for hosting this session and Clancy from um, Arts Council for being part of this and mo most but um, and last but by no means least uh, Alan from Slunglow who for giving his time to talk to us about how we can do these um, events. I will be sending an evaluation out that will ask um, what future sessions people might want to see um, uh, fill that in and, and let us know and we will um, be looking at doing another one of these in the um, autumn. Thank you very much to everybody that contributed and that has been around today. That's it. Done. That's it. That's it. No more. Done. Shush. <laughs>